And welcome again to the latest in our little series of interviews to keep everybody up to speed with what's happening in rugby league um, throughout this uh, pandemic shutdown. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that today's guest, who had agreed to appear live, as it were, up at uh, one of our venues for our lunch pre us having to close it down, is with us today. That's Julia Lee. Um, who I'm sure will come back and do a live version later on. But uh, thanks for giving up your time today anyway, Julia. Oh, my pleasure for, for asking. I, I need to be kept out of trouble, so this is a really good way of doing it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah, I think the three of us, uh, oh, it's good for the three of us through that. Um, I'm going to, at the risk of sounding formulaic, I'm going to start as we always seem to start. And when we talk about early memories of rugby league, now, if my memory serves me correct, uh, you're a big Robins fan, and KR was your um, first input into the game, so to speak, as, as a fan, as a child. Ah, absolutely, and still is, yeah. I'm a trustee good, now good. at Hull KR, so I'm trying to give back to what they gave me as a young girl. So, yes, I discovered rugby league as a very young girl, a sort of, well, I was about seven or eight when my uncle used to talk about rugby league and Hull KR. But I didn't get to go to my first game until I was 12 because it wasn't appropriate for girls, apparently. Oh, right. Um, all that swearing and all those sort of things might not have uh, uh, been appropriate. My uncle was just very concerned about all of that. So, yeah, my first uh, – well, it wasn't my first game because uh, I had, did go to a game before it. But actually, the first one I can remember is Wembley 1980. So, so what a game to, to – Well, exactly. – to be born into the sport – were you the one that turned the light out on the way out then? <laughs> I think I was, yeah. I think that was the big sign on the roadside as you left Hull on the motorway, wasn't it? Oh, it was. And funnily, out, the switch. Yeah, and funnily enough, there's um, at Hull KR, where they all, they, they all stand in the ground, there's actually uh, a banner saying that, just above where yeah. everyone sort of goes under. I don't know if you've noticed just it when you've been to see them but it's lovely yeah and i had a yeah. picture taken with it for my website the other day or the other week because i just thought you know that just well it's just a lot of history for me isn't it such a yeah. memory and is, is there a bar or is it actually a special group of people that's actually called after the score in that final there was a bar but now we, we've put that to bed because we thought it was about time we stopped taunting our rivals around right it. so there was the 10-5 yes um of which it's been was renamed a couple of seasons ago actually but there is a 10-5 club i still i would imagine they wouldn't have got rid of that with the players actually, in yeah 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 but there's actually now the the rooms have all been renamed um just because um unfortunately it still upsets the team on the other side of the city and we'd, we would hate to do that and, you, you, and yet if the if the shoes had been on the other foot you don't necessarily think there might be any, there might not be a great deal of sympathy coming the other way but, yeah. <laughs> absolutely not absolutely not absolutely well you not. think of a childhood growing up and i've often sort of discussed this because a couple of uh, last couple of last couple of years i've been collecting memories of women in rugby league yeah and a lot of um about history of uh, women particularly in Hull and supporters and things like that so it always comes up I've been talking to women on the black and white and red and white side and the derbies always come up and some of the, the childhood stories are just amazing sorry Malcolm no no I was going to add to you there but one for your one for these stories about Boulevard so it, it, it is one for you guys to have a go at um, Pat was cheerleading it in you know back in those uh, well, six late sixes and so forth, and I think she tells a tale, my wife, of going round the stadium and asking her please and where the ladies were in Hull. He said, what <laughs> ladies in Hull? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll le leave you with that one. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think we ought to. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear, that is funny. on on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have childhood memories of, you know, my music teacher in my secondary school. So I would have been, cause they have three levels of school at that time when I was a kid. So you have the primary, junior and senior. So it was the nine to 12 year old of the music teacher being a black and white. And when we walked in, he, he played Red Red Robin wrongly on his piano and then obviously went into big, uh, yeah. big old faithful doing it all right and was going yeah, with our yeah. scarves, hanging out our bags and all that sort of thing just to talk, oh, I don't eat bacon and all that sort of thing. So yeah. a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, great stuff. Yeah. So, so you're there as as a as a died in the wool Robins fan. That's how you got introduced to the game. Um, and then as time goes on, uh, once again, I've actually done a bit of research on this as well as having heard you speak before. You decide to take up refereeing because of something you saw in a programme, am I correct? Yeah, yeah, they were advertising for referees. And at that time, I, I admit to being a referee abuser uh, with very choice words. Guilty, guilty as charged. <laughs> And um, after I'd had a few pale ales, actually, because that was my tipple then, and as still is. And I said to him, oh, look, I can do better than any of these clowns. So one of my friends said, well, I bet you were fiver. You dare apply. So that was then where it all started. So I applied. Um, but I didn't actually said whether I was male or female. So I just signed it, J. Lee. Um, and then I got a return letter saying, dear Mr. Lee, you're really, really very welcome. Um, but then when I rang up, um, the then secretary, a guy called Tony Randerson, who refereed very high level, he was, well, he touched, judged Wembley's international games, things, and, and he, I think he still referees as a match commissioner now, um, then rang me and went up, oh, but you're a girl. Oh, I am, I am, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so then they had to have a few meetings before they actually let me in. So I think it was about three months before they actually decided that they'd invite me to my first meeting and my memory of it was just so funny because it's like a bit like you know stars in your eyes where you to to, today um i am going to be um well it was a bit like that so but it was smoke in those days you could smoke in the um clubhouses and it was in yes yes a working man's club where they used to meet um and i sort of and that i swear to this day they claim it wasn't but i swear to this day that they all told me half an hour later than everyone else because it was packed um and i walked in and, the, and it was the best attendance ever at the whole referee society to see this woman rocking up um and it was like through smoke and today I'm yes, a referee yes, there, yes, and they're, yep. they're like, oh here she is here she is mm. um, and i just sort of plonked myself i mean i was only 17 at the time so you can imagine i think um, to be honest that's very very brave for a, for a yeah. 17 year old girl albeit if you've been if you've been to places like Craven Park, you're not going to be tissue skinned, but to still go in a <laughs> room full of men who you might have the impression might be a little bit hostile before you start, I thought was very brave. Yeah, well, it was worth a fiver though, Ian. Don't forget. Well, fair you know? enough. And of course, I, I, I didn't want to sound like I'm making you out to be very, very old, but a fiver was, was something to have in those days. Oh, it was something <laughs> to have, yeah, yeah. And a dare's a dare, isn't it? And exactly. I didn't really, if I'm honest, I didn't know. I, I, it was in those times, I mean, those that sort of know about feminism and the different waves of it, it was sort of the second phase of feminism. So it was around, so I'd grown up with quite a few things around childhood, around, well, we're equal and I can do what boys can do. But it wasn't cool to be a feminist, particularly. It was like, oh, are you one of them feminists they used to sort of yeah. shoot at you? But I knew when I didn't sign the letter, Miss Lee, that I was, you know, unconsciously, I knew I was, you know, going to ruffle some feathers. And it was all in the, well, you know, why can't I do it? Because they'd not let me play at school. Um, obviously, my uncle had been a bit, oh, well, girls can't. And I thought, you know, I just want to be involved in a sport that I love. So why can't I be involved in any way? And I didn't know what to expect. I mean, at those times, they didn't really train referees. You, you, you took an exam, but I didn't even do that before my first game. And it was like a 40 question and answer exam. They didn't tell you how to referee. You know, I don't know if you've read the Lords of the Game book. It's very ambiguous to say the least. Yes, yes. And it doesn't tell you how to referee. So I went out and I just, I didn't have a clue. So my first game under 11s, where they, the, all of them came out to have a watch of me, threw me a Lords of the Game book. I ended up, I had to borrow my kit. <laughs> Because I didn't even have any kit. Um, and I didn't have a clue. I didn't, couldn't remember what the offside said. Even though I'd been watching it, it's totally different, isn't it, from watching it and seeing it to then Absolutely. actually uh, doing it on the pitch. The under-11s looked like giants. And not one of them was on side for the whole, um, I think it was 20 minutes each way or something like that, the whole 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly a baptism of fire. It was, but not only that, I mean, I moved to London. So I did only two games in Hull 
uh, and then I got a job in London so I then moved to London where they only had open age so then I moved from those two games to suddenly doing these hairy ass blokes in London um, and it was a mixture of then because there was no kids games in London then no because um, that was 1988 so there was Fulham Travellers and um, Fulham Amateurs and then there was London Colonials which was all full of Aussies and Kiwis and uh, so there was about I think there was 20 league. I think it was Mazwala when I went there. So, but it did change over to London League. So you travel to the Midlands for games from yeah, London. Yeah. Can you imagine? So you used to do two or three hours traveling mm-hmm. to games. And I know every time I got a fixture, it was like, oh my God, what have you done? You've got another bloody fixture. You haven't a clue what you're doing. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. So I did dread it. And I did have a big bust up. London Amateurs, uh, Fulham Amateurs v... Um, um, Fulham Travellers uh, they just fought and I did manage to get to the end of the game but I, was, I mean I was 18 and I was just crying coming off the pitch because I didn't have a clue but they all remind me of it you remember when you yeah. cried when yeah. we, we had a bit of a punch up <laughs> a bit harsh that yeah but, yeah just, just yeah. A, what, sorry yes, Malcolm no that just something like that Julia so you would have had two chaps do you have any um, touch judges? Much, 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 much? Oh, not in London. No, there was only something like, I think we had about 10 referees in the society then or something like that. What? Um, what? So, yeah. And they were just all on. That's, I think that's why I got my open age gig and why they accepted me. They were just absolutely desperate, desperate right. for referees. But where I'm going is people will say, oh, would think automatically, wouldn't you get support from the sidelines? No, because... Oh, no, not on those there. games. No, no, no. no, no. Sorry, and even yeah. when I when I came back later, you know, um, and you're doing community games, the only time you get touch judges was finals. Mm-hmm. Um, if, or if they're national conference upwards and not all national conference, you got touch judges. So, yeah. you know, when you went and so I used to often travel three or four hours, be on my own referee and come home. And there was no m- mentoring then. There was, there was nothing like that. It was, and I think that's why I found my first five years really tough because I wasn't learning anything. I was, I wasn't being taught anything. I was just muddling my way through, really, about mm. making it up as I went along. A lot of people would say referees do that anyway, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. Go, go on, Ian. Back, back to you. Sorry, mate. <laughs> no, no, you're yeah. fine. Um, now, obviously, you must be doing something right because, all right, the, the, you could argue that down in London when they're short of officials... Um, it, it might be quite easy to continually get fixtures, but of course, you're growing up through the leagues and you're getting up the levels. I mean, I know, for example, I think the first time I actually saw you referee was in a, a conference league game at, uh, oh, what's the place at Garforth, where this museum's in, used to Alton. be in the pub. Alton. Alton. I remember Alton, you yeah. refereeing at Alton once, and uh, yeah. like you say, some of the touch lines in some of these places can get pretty raucous mm. um but five or ten minutes into the game i think people realize actually this lad seems to know what she's doing mm. which obviously is a great help it does for any sense. referee <laughs> they suddenly think that well this referee seems to know what he's doing um and things went down so you're working your way up so mm. it's it's you may have found it tough, but you must have been doing something right to get up to conference league level because yeah. no mugs don't end up there, do they? No, no. And I always say my breakthrough was because in 1980, late on in 1988, I went to Australia for a year. And again, it was to follow rugby league. It was the, the tour, they were touring um, in 88 were the yeah. Great Britain Lions. And I'd said in 1984 when, you know, the... Um, team came the invincibles and they just absolutely ran like a steam train smashed us didn't they and i thought you know the next time they're in australia i'm going to go watch australian rugby league so again not really knowing what i was into i I was always going on tour and i ended up being there a year and refereeing so i went out and i refereed in manly society and they had a totally different atmosphere, you know, a totally different regime. They trained referees. They took, you know, they had special training nights. They looked at fitness. And the great thing about learning to referee in Australia is they have one game after another because of the weather. So they have the under eights um, and then they have right through to open age, right from a Saturday 
and a Sunday. So you've just got loads of game time. And because it's on the same venue, you then got mentors, you then got people looking at you, mm. teaching you how to referee and pointing it. So when I came back from Australia, so it was a great experience. That's how I come I ended up being one of the, the first women in Australia because I was on tour and then decided to referee. It wasn't intentional. Um, and when I came back, I just thought, you know, I'm going to have a real good go at this now. Because uh, at that time, um, and I'd moved back up north, I thought, do you know, I can do this now. Because I'd been given the tools, the training, I felt as though I'd millage. And at that time, Fred Lindop had taken yeah, over the yeah. referees. And he'd begun to put structures in place, which weren't in place when I started refereeing. So um, he did a great job of... Um, grading them putting them into grading which is the still more or less in the same grading structure to be honest um i also began to look at um working when jeff berry came in um at training referees because because i'd never had it i thought well i can help other referees to learn what i learned in australia really and and begin to help referees through so when i came back i thought right so i did my fitness test wasn't that easy it sounds like it's easy was that that was 20 times around the track at thorns park so it was 20 20 times around and i think you had to do it in 37 and a half minutes or something like that uh, and i'm not built for um that sort of running <laughs> not a marathon say, runner not a marathon runner uh, but you know they were great and they had regular training nights where we all got together um and then we got assessed as well we had proper assessments although there still was club assessments when i first did it which club assessments uh, you know if you've if they've won you've had a great game if they've lost you've had the worst game ever so yes, it's always yes. difficult to be assessed by clubs um and then yeah uh, national conference and that started being you know that was taking off then and southern conference as it was then so although when i did first come back i did sunday league in hull which anyone that's done Sunday anything, yes. um, whether it be football or rugby league, um, it taught me how to deal with foul play, <laughs> is all I can say. Yeah. Um, mm. So I used to have an average on a Sunday of three or four players off. Uh, my record was six in one game. Uh, it was just violent. There used to be players rock up, and football was the same. You know, a night out on the beer on the Saturday night, they decided yes. to play a bit of sport at 11 o'clock. And thank goodness it's not going anymore because it was, it, it was dangerous to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I really got my, um, you know, I really built my resilience and skills up as a match official there. And then when I came to national conference, it's actually, it was a reason that it was great national conference because it was, it was better than, a, I thought it was better than academy and a team to referee because you had a mixture of the old pros coming back into the community game, into the amateur game and the young kids coming through so you had to referee it you know you had yes. to there's i always say when you referee there's there's a level where you have to hold a game in some games where it could boil over but if you hold it enough then they get a real physical game as it was then particularly um and they're the sort that i used to love refereeing so yeah, all yeah. One, of, one of the most physical teams as well they were brilliant that like you mentioned so yeah, yeah yeah what would you say was the pinnacle of your if you're to choose one game what would you say was the pinnacle of your refereeing career um there's two i'm, I'm going to say two i'm going to pick fair two, enough, fair enough. that's all right um yeah. i did internationals for women's games so i um refereed in australia the women's internationals the first ever tour in 1996 of which i'm doing some work on now to get those women recognized yeah, yeah. Because they've never been capped. So I refereed in that tour where the women won the Ashes. So that is sort of like, that was the last team to win yeah. any Ashes uh, in rugby league. Uh, and then I think the most historic was when I did Oxford v Cambridge. Um, yeah. And I got a month's worth of publicity, really, because it was the first time a woman had ever done it. And it was just, you know, it, it, it wasn't a high quality game, but it was a high level of the amount of publicity, the people that were yeah, playing yeah. and those sort of things. Um, yeah, I mean, it's I, the first, yeah. first and last time I've ever been sung on the terraces. The referee is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I mean... I used to be involved in student rugby league, uh, and, and you're absolutely right. The Oxford and Cambridge game sometimes was, wasn't the best rugby going, mm. but the attention that it attracted to the, to the universities and colleges game, you're absolutely right. It, it was 
it's the promotion game in the universities. Mm. Malcolm? I was going to say, that, that, isn't that a quality of the spectator? You know, you say the quality of the players, but, you know, I say old chap. <laughs> absolutely absolutely Maybe. but i think i think the biggest crowd was when i did the um yorkshire women v lancashire women mm. in 19 was it 1992 yeah it was and it was just the women's game it's, it's set up in 1985 and, I'm, and again i'm just doing the whole history of this and the rugby league in the wisdom put it, it, it there used to be two prem you know the premiership games yeah, there Trafford, used to be a double header, double header. Yeah. and the women played in between that, so there was fifty six thousand people um, in Old Trafford, and I refereed the women's game in between. So that was just like an experience beyond any other experience. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, it must be absolutely yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Um, and moving on now from from you know we've had the highlights of your playing game and where you you know where you started and worked your way through. Post the playing career, or, or was it still while you were refereeing that the development work came along? Well, it happened that it just it, it finished my refereeing. I got very badly injured. A player ran into me in, from the a Southern Conference game. Um, so I started working in Leeds. So I was the Leeds Service Area Quarter in 19, 1998. Um, I got the job. Uh, Gary Hetherington had wisely, as he often does in development, had realised the value of development offices um, and half-funded one for Hunslet um, uh, based with the council. Um, and my refereeing, I'd got injured in 1998. I tried to keep on refereeing, but, but by 2000 I had to I had to give up because I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't no longer referee. But as it was, you know, it consumed me, did the job. I mean, I just absolutely loved the development. It was just like your hobby is a job. Yeah, and in those yeah. days, development officers did everything. So I did from, you know, coaching in schools to working with high performance kids to running coaching courses, match official courses, setting up girls teams, you know, you, you name it, you did it as a development officer then. And it gave me really great knowledge to then help me progress me through my career. Um, because I knew a bit about everything, I, you know, yeah. in, in the development um, arm. And I just absolutely loved it. It was exhausting. Uh, being one of those officer, uh, as Malcolm knows <laughs> yes yes I'm going to say I believe Malcolm you weren't you the similar role for Calderdale at the time yes that's right if you remember Joey I, I was yeah it, it was one role but um if I just try to think of the director the CEO at Halifax at the time and, um but I couldn't do the rugby league side the performance delivering of that and uh, Marty Gonzalez was asked to do that and said would would you do the sort of you know developing of the of the of the other stuff and we sort of we dual rolled it and i remember just mm -hmm. traveling off to my normal job over the pennines when i think andy arlen rang me and said i need to meet you you guys need to meet up because you just you know you want to meet me etc etc so i yes and, and that's where that started and it wasn't yeah, yeah. Was, was it andy harland who put that together together I can't remember too much yeah yeah well I I quite quickly went to I became the Northwest regional manager and then I was in that and then became the Yorkshire manager and that's I think when we formally met really so that would have sort of been early um early 2000s I think now because we were beginning to really develop the service areas then yeah. weren't we because yeah, Andy was Yorkshire manager originally so I imagine he, he did introduce us mm. um but, it, you know, the service area structure, it was just an awesome structure. Unfortunately, people lost the way a bit making it a performance structure because it was never meant to just be performance. No. Um, and I do believe that I think the RFL are thinking of putting something similar in now. You know, we should right. never have. It was just, you know, it really brought the game on le leaps and bounds. Yeah, I, I sorry, we were, one of our meetings up at Thromali and I was talking, to, I invited Gary, um, sorry, um, Graham Garrett. Ah, oh, right, lovely. Yeah, yeah, with one of his, his his players playing friends, and of course, we alluded to this, and we, we we pointed out to the audience, didn't we, and how many Super League players just from Calderdale, you know, yeah. which was the smallest local authority area. Yeah, are there at a very top level now, isn't it? You know, um, so you're oh, about it was brilliant. It was brilliant, and it was just a really good way of. Um, players knowing a really having a really clear path and, and equality I thought it, because everybody yeah, could yeah. have a go at it and um, you know everyone could come along for the trials and from a service you know the, the performance side of things 
And I then ran sort of part of my career when I became a Yorkshire manager, Northwest Yorkshire manager, and eventually the national manager, ran all the performance counts around the country. Mm. And so now some of my babies like James Graham and the Burgesses, they were sort of 12, 13 coming through. Right. Um, you know, saw some real talented players come through that system. And I'm not saying that it was perfect, but I just thought it was, a re- it was one that was open for all. Uh, yeah. from a boy's perspective because yeah. uh, there wasn't anything particularly for girls um and i just thought it was a really good way um, i remember um luke oh who plays for rhinos now just gone from castleford luke gale gale yeah. he didn't get in the service area team in leeds he when he was 12 13 yeah. yeah 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 i always remember that because they were really yeah. undecided mm. um, it, it, it's yeah. interesting actually because Whilst the people who are on the website and listening in don't have the, the, the benefit of the visuals that we have, when you were talking about James Graham and the Burgess boys coming through, you could see the pride in your, in your face that this mm. was something that you'd help set up and run and look what we've produced. Absolutely. You know, and I don't think there's anything better than sort of seeing later on. And they don't probably, I mean, actually, you'd, um, they don't probably don't even remember you, but you know you played a part in a young person's life that they've then gone and played for the country and to the levels that they have as well. You think, yeah, Do you know that is really something, isn't it? That's a legacy. That's really making That's a difference. That's the word I've been searching for. Legacy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the same with referees. You know, all the referees programs and the girls programs that are put in place when I was in Leeds. I now sometimes see, you know, people come up to me. Oh, I remember, you know, when you were service area coordinator or Yorkshire manager or national manager, and you know, giving me my chance. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, and it's just it's a real honor, isn't it? And a privilege to be in yeah. that and then something that you absolutely love um, and then see them succeed, whatever success is for them as well. Well, um, that, that, that you see, I, I, I taught for 35 years, so that's the sort of thing that I harp back on. It, it's you're absolutely right when you say that the, the standard to base yourself on is success for them. Not necessarily success as Joe Public might see it. It's not necessarily producing your James Graham and your Burgesses, your internationals. But if you get a child of, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11 or whatever, and they get a love of the sport for life, and they might only play in the, in the fourth division of the local Pennine League or something like that, but they play every week, and then they become supporters of the amateur, you know, the community mm-hmm. game as well, or they become officials and people like that and it's i love the expression that you came out with when you said success for them which could be very high or it could just be at a lowest level but to them is a huge amount and actually in sports so great for um you know helping people particularly that have challenging backgrounds or don't have all the start in life to be able to make a difference and rugby league in particular and that's why I stayed in rugby league for so long because the difference we could make to people I mean I know on some of our camps we had kids that were you know they were lawbreakers the police you know were were up in arms about them Um, but on the camps we had them on you wouldn't have known you know because rugby league gave them their purpose and i do a lot of work with young people and women now and i call it what makes you tick because i knew that rugby league made me tick and goodness knows where i would have been and i've seen so many young people that through rugby league sport and and the arts actually played something but my obviously my everything i've done is ever ever been with rugby league is that it makes such a difference and can change someone's life um that it you know it's it's just critical yes Malcolm. I, I, well I, I can endorse that and clearly i'm not going to mention any names but um when we were doing the calderdale service area stuff and my wife joined us you know in the background she came, we came home and, and and she mentioned it that one mother um on her own with 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 the, with the guys this young guy is now a Super League player and hardly got any chance brass, you know, so everybody had to pay, pay their way, but quite honestly, you know, yeah, but pay it installments, do so, so, do that. And you make it for behind the scenes, you work for them, don't you? Mm, yeah, mm. absolutely. Uh, and the amount of, yeah, absolutely. And it, and, and it, and it comes back in, in, in a positive way, you know, that's so what you've just mm. been saying there is right, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it can just, you know, if sometimes, you know, if, if it's what makes you tick, and it gives you some sort of pleasure and um you know 
a purpose for getting up in the morning or for carrying on with your life, then it's just really key. I know just something came to mind when we're talking about lead service area, because in those days we didn't really have anything for players when they'd no longer played. Um, I always remember meeting Roger Millward in, um, in a school uh, and he was a caretaker you know, in a school and you're thinking, oh my God, you know, I, I, he opened the school up for me to do my coaching course, wow. you know, so it was like, it's not so long ago that, that, you know, we had nothing. And I remember Paul Harkin, who was my childhood hero, he was living in the area and I bumped into him and I put him on a coaching course because he wanted, you know, to go into coaching and various other things, not realizing that actually, because it wasn't, I think it was probably two years later, he says, thank goodness someone recognized me saw that I had value and gave me a job in the game. He said, because nobody else was doing anything. And it just, you know, it can give people so much, but it also can take it away if we don't do it right. And I think as a sport, we do do it a lot better than we used to. Um, but the value of those players that they can have in communities to change people's lives is just so important. It's immense. It's immense. Mm. Um, and in this development role, I mean, you end up being sort of, as you said, the manager, the national manager and what have you. Um, and we're instrumental in getting an enormous amount of money from Sport England. I know, I know. 28, 29 million, I think it was, or something like that, wasn't it? I mean, the numbers are just, they're just mind-boggling. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and it was a great team. So um at the time when i first joined the rfl in 2000 it was that rugby league world cup that was an absolute nightmare um, and we had two years of bit of being a bit unsettled but then spot england that was the time when national lottery was beginning and performance yeah. programs and and my boss at the time was a guy called gary tasker who was involved in in that time at oddsall um, and all the bull mania and all those sort yeah, of things. Yeah. And he came to the RFL and he had such vision. He was a lot of my leadership skills and things that I delivered later on were down to his leadership skills. And he saw my talent and embraced what I could do um, around getting funding, around engaging with people, my knowledge for the sport and, and my passion for development. Um, and allowed me to lead the bid. It really, he, it should have been his job, to be honest. But he just saw that that's, you know, he's he a very humble man. Very yeah. humble man. I'm not saying that he didn't want to work either. Mm -hmm. um, but we also had a really good team of people. So uh, there was Neil Wood, Kelly Barrett, who's still at the RFL. She's been, she was with Barla from being 16. Yeah. Um, and a guy called Adam Jude and Andy Harland. And, you know, we had nothing really up until they came up. And then... We built it. Richard Lewis was there at the time, so he was oiling a lot in London. Yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of um, making sure rugby league was in it in the top five then, because it wasn't. Because I always swear that if at that time we'd really embraced it, we would have been well ahead of rugby union, and unfortunately we didn't. Um, and we got this 29 million, which was to develop the sport. So we then had 140 staff around the country. I mean, you were very involved with that, Malcolm, weren't you? And everything that we we did for development, because my the intention of the plan was everybody everywhere had an opportunity to play rugby league. So right sort of from the deepest, darkest south to um, right in the northeast. And we had a team of development officers uh, and coaches just spreading uh, what rugby league was about. And at that time, actually, we, we had a whole development plan for girls that never came into fruition, which were, <laughs> I, I get a bit frustrated, which is one of the reasons I left. Um, that, you know, in 2008, we had the vision and it's only now that that's been realised, really. But, do you know, things happen at, at a time for the right reason. It probably wasn't right then, but it is now. But, yeah, our vision was to do what they're doing now um, mm. in the women's game, part of that, that money. But, yeah, very exciting times. And, of course, um, being the lead in the 2013 World Cup as well. Yeah, the Festival of World Cups. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was the director of the Festival of World Cups, which, again, I'm so proud of because... Um, leading up to it, it I wasn't popular is, is leaders to say only because there wasn't any money and I kept saying well I want to run this festival cup where are you going to get the money from we haven't got any money we've got a, a men's world cup to run which is priority um, so I was on zero budget because then the international federation <laughs> didn't it? but I was so passionate my passion for everybody everywhere wanting to play the sport so 
to the highest level so the women you know it's the highest level they can achieve in the sport playing for their yeah. country as it is with wheelchair um, and then the police uh, the UK Armed Forces and the students again have always been part and parcel of my development arm of rugby league and I wanted to have them to all have their time you know in in the sunlight bathing in it um, but all at once within a two two and a half week period three week period so on very little money, um, and I still don't know to this day how I did it. Rear Tennant likes to say that he played a big part. He did actually help me try and get some money. Um, we pulled off um, 76 games um, with 26 countries uh, over a two and a half week period. And, I, and it's brilliant because that to me was the bedrock of where we are now with the Rugby League World Cup. So we showcased the women who got the biggest crowd. The wheelchair, who people were astounded at the um, athleticism and the entertainment of the wheelchair game, because it's just go watch it, anyone. If you get to see any games, it's yeah, just. Yeah, funnily enough, last the last interview we've just completed with, with two brothers that are part of the Halifax uh, Wheelchair Rugby League Club, mm. and uh, the discussions we were having there as well. I had to fess up and say I'd not been to one. Oh, brilliant um, to watch. And, and they looked to me as if to say, you don't know what you're missing, pal. No, absolutely. So when it comes next year, you know, get yourself to a game because it's ju- it's rugby league as we know it, but it's just, it's so exciting. So the Festival of World Cup really showcased those and I, that's yeah. now what it's led to them, you know, being part and parcel, equal pay on the same playing field and everything else, which to me was my end result for the women in the wheelchair in particular. Yeah. Um, and they are going to do other festivals of World Cups uh, around the main event, but mine was always around the wheelchair and the women. That is the highest level those athletes can get to. So yeah. we need to have them on the same, same footer as the men. And yeah, I, Malcolm. And just to su- support that, Julie, yes, and on a match official, in similar things happened there. Uh, women, uh, sorry, male or female, have, have had to step back from the running game because it's you know hundred hundred meters uh, running, you know, eighty minutes. Um, they, they, they've been able to two or three have been able to join that system as well because it's, they, they've got the match official in background. They don't have to run as far but they can do what they're good at. So it's, it's surprising mm. the spin-offs that come from these things, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's brilliant. And again, to officiate, it's totally different. I got involved in 13 and then in 17 because um, there was a Festival of World Cup in 17 in Australia and I went out to it in the laws of the game for wheelchair, which um, Martin Coyd, who was um, you know one of the guys that brought it and actually hosted 13 in Medway, um, he's really clear that it's got to be, it's a, an inclusive game. So there's no uh, criteria for who can play, who can't play. Um, and it's got to be as close to the running game as possible. But France is where it was first developed. Yeah. So I cannot tell you how many um, meetings like this, um, on it was on Skype then, mm-hmm. I had to uh, referee <laughs> <laughs> around the rules the laws of the game for wheelchair <laughs> because we didn't want to lose what it was about but also it was important that every because in in um i think it was 13 no it was before then there'd been an international and it was so confusing where the laws were that we wanted to make sure that it was right for the participants more than anything else so they knew but um it, it's a as i say the wheelchair is brilliant and the women's as i say in that festival and in 17 we got more spectators than any other game and people are always astounded uh, when they come and watch a women's game as well about the athleticism and the skill um that the women the women display absolutely and and it's that athleticism and skill that that means it's worth what you see in a lot in a lot of things as you mentioned earlier m- money money talks and the fact that at the next world cup all three groups the men the women and the wheelchairs are getting equal pay which in a lot of industries even today that's not the case is it no, so absolutely. i think that shows how seriously we should I and mean, and most of us are taking the women's game and the wheelchair game, it, you know, alongside the men's game. And I can't speak highly enough for John Dutton, uh, the CEO of the Rugby League World Cup, and how he's built the team and the values around the World Cups. It's yeah. no easy feat to put two World Cups, which 
um, weren't seen on an equal footing to begin to put that truly put them on an equal footing you know because people say a lot oh we'll run them at the same time but actually to demonstrate that in so many different ways you know is it, it, you know, I, I've got such admir admiration, admiration for him, and I just hope that then wherever the next World Cup goes, that they do something very. I'm on the, I chair the Women and Girls International Steering Group, um, and you know, we talk a lot around that when a competition comes up, let's not just tag the women in the wheelchair on. Let's presume that everybody's playing in that competition, unless for some other reason that they can't, because that's true equality, isn't it? Mm. True diversity. Yeah, but, yeah. The yeah. fact that the three of them are in it, unless, as you say, for some reason, a section pulls itself out or what have you. But that mm. it should be a case of the natural order of things. Is well, we've done three this time. It'll be three next time, and it should always be three. Yeah, absolutely. And whether they run them at the same time, I don't know. But I quite like the fact that all three are running at once at the moment. I just, I, I, I think, think it's, it's something special. Idea. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it is something special. And, and what, you know, the wheelchair and the women's might stand on its own at some point, but I don't know if it's the next one, but other people will make that decision. I, I, and, that, and that would be progress, but I, I think, yeah. as you say, even the sheer acceptance at the moment that all three are in the same wheel. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, isn't wonderful. it? Yeah. And I would never have imagined that in 13 after the fight I had just to get it on, to actually see it being played it's just you know um, it's just a, a lovely moment really and if, if if we can go a little bit more personal now um in in terms of the common sense initiative ah my up. company yeah yeah um, because uh, as i said i was I, I read a little bit about it and it, it's interesting that if i've got the information right you you help set it up with, with somebody who was one of the few top women's football referee um, yeah we've got a partnership not common sense itself we've got another program that we run together right um, but i left the rfl rugby league four years ago um i was becoming a bit of a grumpy old woman if if i'm honest um and i really wanted to make positive difference and the way the governance was and things i wasn't given that freedom my, my wings were only because of governance nobody was it was nothing intentional no. but I, i'm a bit of a rover that's what um sorry gary tasker and 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 richard lewis used to let me rove around and have a go at things and it, it wasn't like that at the governance anymore so i wanted to make a difference but i particularly wanted to make a difference to young people and women and through what i'd experienced i wanted to bring my experience of leadership um, and I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do, but I did know that a play was written about me, being written about me. Was it called so, Ref? Called Ref. Ref, yeah, yeah, by Sarah Jane Dickinson. And I did know that that had potential to have an impact on others, as in role modelling and taking it to communities. That I love theatre, but I particularly love Micron, Red Ladder, you know, those sort of little um, theatre uh, Micron Theatre, is that the one that used to do round in a barge yeah yeah it still does oh, yeah, yeah, yeah yes yeah, yeah. yes yeah. i know exactly who you mean yeah. i think they're wonderful oh uh, and i just loved play and i'd been to the theater quite a lot so when sarah jane dickinson approached me the playwright and i went well i want it like this she went oh no west end then <laughs> <laughs> and I, went, no, I want our little venues and i wanted it to take it to communities that didn't go to the theater so this is why i know where the arts and sport can work so well together around reaching people that um, you know, this sort of thing wouldn't reach people without having this, my story sort of yeah, as, as the yeah. centre of it, being able to inspire others. So I knew I sort of had that in the background and I hadn't a clue what I was going to do. So I've reinvented myself. Um, I knew I wanted to make positive difference to young people and women. So I'm now what's called NLP practitioner, master practitioner, which is neuro linguistic programming and a hypnotherapist. So, but basically what it does is it, it just works with mindset. So around, I had lots of negativity in my life, being told I couldn't, I wasn't good enough, I couldn't do things. And I had a lot of self-doubt. A friend of mine about seven years ago when I'd said to him, oh, I wish I could achieve something. And he went, you what? <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But that in my mindset was where it was. And, and until I met the playwright um, and also Space Two, who produced the play, I mean, they've been champions of me. I didn't believe I'd really achieved anything. 
So my work's all around helping young people and women to give them the resilience and the strength, but also the belief that they can achieve whatever they want, whenever they want to. And also if they have achieved to make sure they celebrate that achievement. Cause I never spent yes. much time yes. patting myself on the back. If I'm honest, I was so busy looking for what next and Oh God, what can I do? Um, so I do a lot around mindset, confidence, self-esteem. Um, I work with men and women, but I've got a leadership program, energetic and, and in, in uh, leadership that I'm developing now. And that's very much around mindset, not particularly the core skills of leadership, but about mindset as a leader and setting really high level intentions so you can achieve. Because that's what I kept doing, but I never knew I was doing it. So yeah, yeah, well, um, yes. it's lovely to be able to do it. And we take the play, hopefully, touch wood, uh, ref will be touring next year we've obviously with all this that's been going on the grants have yeah. been frozen but we had a big 30 um day tour 30 venue tour last year right around for next year planned for around the uk so what that's going to look like i don't know because we wanted to take it to everywhere um that i'd ever refereed so that people could all have in these small venues whether it be a library space or a rugby club or are a bit of a bigger theatre for the playwright. Um, but yeah, when House of Commons wanted us in as well. So next year we've still got things to do around that, but also part of Common Sense is um, I've got a heritage project that the, I mentioned about the, the women um, internationals. There's about 150, 200 women who have never been capped for playing for Great Britain. They sort of five tours of the Forgotten Tours 1996 being one of them right up to 2003 uh we haven't got a hall of fame for women as yet so part of that i want to and, bring and about like nearly every club never mind internationals nowadays have a heritage number for a player yeah, absolutely and these great britain women haven't so i want to sort of begin to bring that in plus i want to bring to life the history of the women's game and the the heroes you know the 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 pioneers that set yeah, up the women's yeah. game and let's champion some of these women you know there's some uh, Lisa McIntosh Brenda Dobeck I was just Geldin, about to mention Lisa Halifax yeah yes you not know, that biased <laughs> yeah yeah you know they've never been celebrated in the sport and we need to no. get their stories out there so Absolutely. I'm hoping next year because it's 20 um, 25 years since the first tour next year and the rugby league world cup are really keen to celebrate um won the international but also women in sports so rugby league, women in rugby league so hopefully if everything settles down i'll be able to get some grants and sort of from january we can yeah. launch all that which is really exciting so i feel as though i've done a full circle of not being able to play as a kid and to referee to now going on to all the heritage bit which is just so exciting for me because you know talking to the women who feel they've been forgotten when you start getting them in a room and talking about the memories, I mean, everything was self-funded. So that tour, Nikki Carter, the team manager, talks about she had 10 weeks to put the tour on to Australia and she had everything in cash because she couldn't have a bank account. So she basically had a briefcase with something like 40 grand in <laughs> <laughs> carrying it around Australia. <laughs> I wish I'd have known. I know. <laughs> So all those sort of stories will begin to, I want to bring to life next year, uh, which will be Wonderful. really exciting. Mm. I'm conscious now, Malcolm, that because of, because of the way things are set up, if our, um, if our tape gets too long, we can't actually get it sent to the club. So <laughs> it, well, it just makes make it a little bit difficult. So we, we have, we've been running, we're, we're, you know, have I gone over my time? We're about much on the button at the moment. That's pretty good, yeah. It's less than an hour. About average of 40, 45 minutes. Our IT man can cope with it. <laughs> but, I, I mean, it's like, I don't know if it's a case of you run out of your time. I could sit and chat oh, yeah. around this all day long. Um, but we are going to pull it to a close and, and say that I have been absolutely fascinated for these for these last 45, 50 minutes. I mean... As I said before, I've met you before, I've listened to you speak before at the Heritage Keys in Huddersfield, but it was like, I've learned a lot of new stuff again today, and I think the work that you've done is is, is outstanding, um, and long may it continue, and I'd just like to say, Julia Lee, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me, I always love talking about myself, so thank you yeah. for giving me that opportunity. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. Well... 
Thank you okay, to both. Well, yeah, yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, no, thank you. I enjoyed that. We'll, yes, we'll, thanks. We'll be... And as I, I said it during the thing, but when we do get up and running again, however long it is down the line, we would yeah, love yeah. you to come back. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. And then people who may listen to you now can then come again and, and put a face to a name. Yeah, and if you want me to put this out as well, so I can put it through my networks and things as well. Absolutely. And anything you do, you know, we can hook in because I'm now got a social media presence. I think I have something like a thousand followers, something oh, ridiculous good. like that. It's, uh, well, I must have my hours, uh, you know, me with the grants and things like that. We've got one or two in linked to the COVID, why we couldn't do things and trying to uh, link other people. And I think we might be having a little bit of, of a chat on buying some services in, to be honest. All oh, right. Okay. So we'll that chat away from here, clearly. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, yeah. No, that'd be great. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Yes, that'd be good. Right. Sorry, man. Everybody, have a good yeah, thank uh, you. rest Thanks of the for day. that, Julie. Really no worries. Lovely to, be, lovely to 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 meet you in in that despite it being via Zoom. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> lovely. Thanks a lot. Bye bye for See now. See you later. Bye. Bye. Cheers, bye.